my screen here. And um, uh, what I wanted to speak about today was um, kind of a bit of a vision of uh, what we're looking to build collaboratively with neurosurgery in the rehab department um, as it pertains to a pipeline for stroke um, and how we can really integrate novel technologies into existing care models. Um, so today, uh, apologies if this is a little bit boring for some people, but today we'll go into nitty gritty around how do we bill for it? How do we sustain it? How do we actually do the things that we know our patients should be getting um, so, that, so that we can engage in best practice? Um, before I begin, uh, I do want to make a couple of quick disclosures. Um, so as Peter mentioned, uh, I am a founding member. I am a co-founder. Uh, Chris Kellner is the other co-founder of Precision Recovery, which is a company that was spun out of Sinai in January of, of this year. Um, and it is a remote physiologic monitoring company for stroke patients. Um, I'm going to be speaking a little bit about the work that we've done at Mount Sinai and plan to continue to do with Mount Sinai. Um, and then also, uh, I'm also uh, on the scientific advisory board of another uh, neurotechnology company. I will not be speaking about this, but I just wanted to have full transparency for you all. Uh, this company is called BeCare, and it is for people with MS, and it allows people with MS to get an EDSS score by interacting with an app. So it's a neurological diagnostic um, tool. And uh, these, you know, as you might see from these conflicts of interest, these are the sorts of things that I'm generally interested in. So um, also uh, for, for anyone who's, who uh, isn't aware of me and isn't aware of, of the, um, the work that I do at Mount Sinai, um, we, we run a number of different centers that are kind of hybrid clinical research and clinical centers where our big mission is to push novel technologies that we think really should have a chance in the rehab world. We push them through rapid pragmatic clinical trials. We try to get things done, not on a, a sort of a five year RO1 timeline, but more like a 12 to 18 month pharma timeline. Um, and then if we're impressed with the outcomes that we're seeing with the technologies, we immediately integrate them into our clinic um, so that patients can access novel technologies um, that, that we're working on. The reason why we do this, we have a few guiding principles, which I'll just quickly introduce you to. The, the first guiding principle that we live by, which is very, very simple, is that in, in the current model, health innovation just takes too long. Um, national average, uh, and I've given this, this number to Department of Neurosurgery before, and it has not changed. Um, the national average to take a, a novel technology from bench to bedside is 17 years. Um, and we just believe that that is far too long of a number. And, and so one of our guiding principles is how can we as members of an academic medical center with, who will, you know, a powerful name and a powerful brand, how can we shorten that time for technologies that we think have stand an authentic chance of really helping our patients? You know, if our patients don't get this technology, their rehabilitation will be stalled or slowed, or they won't reach the heights that they could reach. Um, the second guiding principle that we live by in the Abilities Research Center is really community co-design. So with all of our clinical trials, we won't run a clinical trial on a technology unless we have a population who is asking us for the technology. Um, this is an example of um, a clinical trial that we were running with patients with spinal cord injury, <clears throat> looking at a novel neuropathic pain intervention. And so of course we had a room full of people with spinal cord injury and we were recording their feedback on our protocol. We were listening to what they had to say about whether they thought our protocol was viable, whether we were focusing on the right things, so on and so forth. Um, and then the final one, again, is pretty simple, but we, we just try with a lot of our patients who live with neurological uh, conditions and, and extreme disability, we view ourselves as on the bleeding edge of technology, whether, you know, whether that's uh, us, uh, you know, overhyping ourselves or, or uh, the reality. We view ourselves as always knowing what the latest thing is. And so the pressure that we put on ourselves is 
if there's a patient that is not responding and is wanting to respond, is wanting to reduce their level of disability, we're going to keep trying. We're, we're going to keep trying new technologies. We're going to keep calling them in to try out something novel. Um, there's never a time where we'll say, that's it. This is the level of disability that you can expect for the rest of your life. <clears throat> so those are, are really the three things that we strive to, to live by um, within our centers. Um, and the big question that I want to address today is that's, that's you know, our thinking. And how do we, in a very pragmatic, factual, and you know, straightforward way, how, how are we currently applying this thinking to stroke recovery? Um, so this is, you know, I, I know that I'm missing a lot of steps here. <laughs> and I know that uh, this is a bold slide to put in front of a, a neurosurgery department like, like this, because you guys know stroke. But this is a very basic look at what the typical patient experiences um, following a stroke. And I think, you know, all of these steps along the way, um, I, I think, you know, that Mount Sinai does this much better than most hospitals. But I also think that this final step, we can all agree that we wish we did better. We, we lose a lot of patients to follow up. Um, and uh, it would be better for us and it would be better for the patient if, if we didn't. Um, and so this is some of the, you know, some of the things that we've, we've been thinking on is how do we create communities? How do we create programs that bring stroke survivors in and, and keep them uh, so that we can make sure that they aren't at risk of a second stroke? We can make sure that they're getting all available uh, clinical care that they could possibly need or want. Um, so with this in mind, we, I wanted to sort of reimagine how how we do this and you know the, a lot of this work and and you, you'll see lots of acknowledgements along the way has been done in deep collaboration with the department of neurosurgery so i'd say step one is just having a lot of uh interdepartmental collaboration but um you know the first the first few reasons that we lose people in the health system is we're all busy and it's hard to find fiscally sustainable ways to keep track, track of patients. You know, keeping track of a, a stroke survivor is hard. You know, you actually more often than not need to get FaceTime with them or call them or, you know, chase them down and make sure they're doing the things that we're doing that, that they should be doing. And there's nothing really that we can, um, it, it's hard for us to find the, the resources to have someone who is so high touch working with the patient. Um, also, on the rehab side, we're always fighting against insurers because long-term rehabilitation has a questionable track record. You know, we stop outpatient rehabilitation maximum at six months, um, if not much, much sooner, because insurers stop paying and, and tell us that there's no value in continuing. Um, and then, you know, even if you could uh, uh, do something like, for example, Nick Ward, who is... Uh, leading um, UCL's chronic stroke rehabilitation program, who has incredible outcomes um, showing that intensive, multimodal, interdisciplinary, um, aggressive rehab in stroke survivors can produce 14 to 18 point bumps on the Fugelmeyer. Even if you can you know, convince people that that is worth doing, um, it's, it's really hard to get a lot of stroke patients to commit to an intensive location-based outpatient therapy because they're disabled, their significant other or, you know, primary caregiver is, um, uh, you know, is probably also not without disability and a little bit older. And so it, it really is quite challenging to, to arrange all of these things. And so we tend to lose people because they don't have time, we don't have time, and we kind of just fall off, fall off the map. So let's go through a thought experiment and think about what an ideal post-discharge pathway would look like. We're going to do things a little bit backwards. Uh, I'm also going to talk about uh, pre-intake <laughs> and inpatient, um, but I want to talk first about things that are actually in place at this moment, which we have data for, and then things that we're planning and building actively. So I think as soon as you uh, discharge someone, one of the first things that we could do that would 
significantly improve outcomes for patients is enrollment into remote, remote physiologic monitoring services. Um, and so if, if my bright flashing uh, conflict of interest lights weren't, weren't enough, this is where the conflict of interest is going to happen because I'm going to tell you guys about precision recovery, which is remote physiologic monitoring. Um, but first, I'm going to tell you about the beginnings of, of the remote physiologic monitoring that, um, that eventually became precision recovery. Uh, because we started uh, investigating and researching remote physiologic monitoring in 2013. Uh, I was working with the Commissioner for Aging in Westchester County to create something that would allow high health risk seniors to have regular interactions and health monitoring, um, uh, you know, as, as they went about their day. So we set up college students who were trained to capture heart rate, blood pressure, weight, SpO2, and ask five subjective wellness questions. And we gathered at places like this. So community centers, public libraries, churches, barbershops, et cetera. And the, so places that, that were already natural gathering spots for the community that we were trying to help. And if we saw something we didn't like, a telehealth nurse would call right in at that moment and say, you know, I'm not liking the look of your blood pressure. Um, what what is the name of your PCP? Oh, you don't have a PCP. Well, I'm going to set you up with an appointment. Don't worry about anything. We'll take care of like making sure that the insurance works and so on. And there's no copay, but we just need to get you to a doctor. Um, so if we fast forward uh, until 2018, when we froze a data set and we had data from uh, 12 sites across four different states, we had 800 participants who had been enrolled in the program for at least one year. They adhered to, at a 78.5% compliance rate, they were showing up to the TIP site once per week to have their, um, their vitals read. <clears throat> and what we were able to show from um, an EMR review and, and publish on was that uh, we were able to show a 60% reduction in um, hospital visits. Um, at, uh, hospital visits being an aggregate of emergency department uh, visits and hospital admissions, and a 75% reduction in under 30 day readmissions. So needless to say, this program is actually still going and has been growing uh, over time. Um, it is funded entirely uh, by local government, because uh, the local government, you know, Westchester County local government think we're geniuses because we run a site like this for $50,000 and uh per year and they save in in terms of uh uh health uh, health costs to the county they save many millions of dollars per site because each site services around 100 older adults so um so this has been this was one of the first impressions to me that um remote therapy uh, remote physiologic monitoring is valuable so long as you can get people to comply we were very, very um, uh, intentional about creating a community around what we were doing, which meant that individuals were sort of jostled each other to show up and make sure that they they showed up on time and and got their health monitoring done. Um, but so long as you can hit nail that compliance, remote physiologic monitoring is incredibly useful and and uh, powerful. So then uh, as we fast forward to 2022, um, Chris and I uh, got together and started to build a remote physiologic monitoring platform for stroke. Um, this is a little bit more intensive than what we were doing with high health risk older adults without necessarily a specific diagnosis that was being managed. Uh, this is a targeted remote physiologic monitoring program for people who have just been discharged um, after a stroke. And so, uh, we become a little bit more focused. Um, you know, we ask them, for instance, on a daily basis to track blood pressure, and we ask them a few subjective questions about how they're doing and are they complying to their medication. We ask them to perform a few movements in front of a camera so that we can use a computer vision algorithm to uh, to evaluate for change, although a clinician also views the videos to make sure that there's no change um, occurring as well. On a weekly basis, we just check in for 10 minutes, a physical therapist or an occupational therapist will check in and make sure that everything's going okay, explain the patient's data to them, explain if there's something to be worried about or 
not something to be worried about because uh, that, again, this is a way of getting adherence to the program is to make sure that the patients understand why they're collecting the data that they're collecting. And then every 30, uh, every 30 days, we will do a longer form interaction with the patient so that we can um, really go through their data with them and let them know what next steps are and how they're doing and so on and so forth. So I won't spend too much time on this slide, but I did promise boredom and this is the boring slide. Um, as it turns out in 2020, CPT codes were approved that actually make this approach financially sustainable. You can bill these CPT codes um, and it's not like it's going to make you, you know, an enormous amount of cash as a provider, but it is going to allow you to do what is best practice, which is keeping an eye on your patient after they leave the hospital. And, and it will actually, um, you know, more often than not, be revenue positive as opposed to revenue negative. And so, uh, you know, just to share a few first outcomes, this is a, a pilot uh, study that we we published uh, that has just been accepted for publication. Um, and, you know, I, I think what is really striking about this is we uh, had a convenient sample of 12 participants. So these were not 12, 12 stroke survivors who were of particular concern to us where we said, well, we better watch these people. We just had a convenient sample of, of 12, you know, the, the, the first 12 that got discharged from the hospital that, that we could enroll into the program. Um, on average, we spent, um, that uh, on average at the time that we froze the data set, we had been monitoring them for 136 days. What we saw was an 86% compliance to daily blood pressure monitoring. And it, they were, the, the patients were incredibly passionate about it. You know, once we explained why we're doing what we're doing and why it's important, um, the feedback that we were receiving from patients was they were saying, this service is great. I feel protected. I feel as though someone's watching over me. I feel that I can interact with a clinician if something's going wrong, because there is a lot of anxiety, as we all know, um, around a second stroke in many stroke survivors. And what was being fed back to us by the patients, even though we were asking for, you know, a big monitoring um, commitment, they didn't mind doing it because they understood that blood pressure is a very important biomarker of understanding who may go on to have a second stroke. And what I think was interesting was in this cohort over, you know, over the monitoring period, we identified 55 blood pressure alerts where people were out of uh, out of what we deemed to be a safe range. Um, and of those 55, you know, we called the patient, we checked in, we, you know, did everything that we needed to do. And 16, it resulted in 16 triage events where we sent patient the patient back to their PCP or their managing physician at the hospital to have a blood pressure medication review or to um, you know, have a few things checked out. And of the 12 participants, two out of 12 actually showed potentially life-threatening events that were identified early. Um, so we were able to stop them in the tracks. One was potentially worsening uh, neurological symptoms and one was um, a heart arrhythmia um, that, that we caught early because while we were monitoring blood pressure, we we're also monitoring heart rate, of course, because the cuff gives us both. So I, I think that this was a very encouraging first step where, you know, I always say the most basic principle of remote uh, physiologic monitoring is if you're looking at if you're looking at a sick person more closely, you're going to find more stuff to fix. Um, and you know, this is something that that keeps coming back um, over and over again. Um, so. That's remote physiologic monitoring. Um, now moving on to remote therapeutic monitoring, um, because I think that a lot of what happens in outpatient stroke rehabilitation is that, uh, you know, if they're lucky, patients get three outpatient visits a day, uh, three outpatient visits a week uh, for a period of, uh, again, if you're lucky, eight to 12 weeks. Um, and uh, and and then if you're lucky as a therapist, you get to see the patient twice a week uh, because 
usually one time at least one time a week they'll cancel because of something due to accessibility or difficulty accessing the center or just not feeling well um and so you know um uh one of my uh favorite colleagues from uh, a company called mind maze uh john krakauer uh often talks about how we expect functional restoration from homeopathic doses of outpatient rehab um and the idea that you know everything we know about promoting plasticity everything we know about promoting motor control and enhancing motor control tells us that we need much much more than that so what we really need is um intensive constant um uh home-based rehabilitation that provides you with feedback if you're doing something wrong because uh once again what our physiology tells us about motor control and, and motor relearning is if i'm told to just sit there with a home exercise program and do this a hundred times movement repetition does not produce neuroplasticity we we know this this has been replicated in animal trials this has been done over and over again movement alone will not produce uh will not produce motor learning or plasticity um movement with knowledge of outcome with constant closed loop real-time feedback that's what produces plasticity that's what produces motor control this is a muscle exercise it will improve the strength of your peripheral muscles it won't do anything else and so um the idea that we can send people home with technologies like the mind maze uh technology mind motion go um, which is a technology we use in clinic now um with, with clients is really compelling um and once again to the boring slide uh as of january this year um we you know see uh, cms passed billing codes that would actually make this financially sustainable and our lab uh is currently in the process of building these in epic so that these these billing codes can be built um you know uh i i think one of the things that we uh often face in hospitals is we're not the most innovative with billing so these were approved in january of 2022 and when we asked for them to be built into epic our finance people said oh are you crazy like <laughs> no one's built these before why would you why would you want to be the first? And I, I was like, why would we not want to be the first to try and build these things? Um, but what these uh, billing codes do is they allow they allow initial support of uh, uh, technology maintenance, the amount of time that a therapist or or PTA spends viewing the data. You know, so this is the home exercise program that you've prescribed. Now let's review how much time the patient actually spent performing the home exercise programs you, you prescribed, how successful they were, so that then on the back end, you can tweak difficulty of the exercises without the patient having to come in and you can have face-to-face -face interactions with them, um, uh, you know, when, when you need to, in order to progress exercises beyond what you're doing in the home exercise program. But really this is tech enhanced home exercise program in a way that promotes recovery in a way that we've not seen before so it's very exciting but it's also not that easy because i i think one of the things that we need to think about is and that we've clearly thought about quite a bit is that um you know even even with those billing codes the billing codes that i just shared with you you'll notice that um this is a fairly fancy system you know it costs a couple thousand dollars to sort of get all the components together because it's a computer and it's a, a motion well it's two motion sensors and it's a, a monitor and, and so on and so forth um and you'll notice here that the reimbursement levels aren't that high and so hospitals are faced with an issue which is well unless you want to invest initially in upfront costs it's really hard to get a fleet of mind motion goes or you know comparable technology into your clinic to send home with patients to bill these rtm billing codes so uh what we did uh as a lab was we actually authored a new cat3 cpt code uh which was in that was 
designed especially for this. It gives you the initial startup costs. And we, we don't know yet what CMS is going to pay, but they said somewhere in the neighborhood of $500 to $1,000. It gives you the initial startup costs to purchase the therapeutic technology that you would then go on to use to build these RTM style codes. Um, so uh, about two months ago, it was approved by the AMA as a test code. So we're going to go out there and test it and and see how it goes. Um, but again, I think that uh, one of the things that I've been learning along the uh, the way of trying to realize this mission of rapidly uh, pushing technologies forward in in the healthcare system is that this is the sort of advocate advocacy you need. If if currently there's no fiscally you know, sustainable way of doing it. It actually wasn't that hard to write the billing code. And once you, once I sat down in front of this board of AMA members, it wasn't that hard to get it approved as a test code. Um, and then from there, if we can't make it work, if we can't show the value, well, that's on us. Um, and I'll, I'll take it. But it wasn't, you know, I would say it was probably 50 hours worth of work over the course of six months to get this done. It was it was not a heavy lift, but we often don't think this way, and so uh, I think uh, pushing for new ICD-10 codes, pushing for new CPT codes, are very powerful ways of really promoting change, not just within your own institution but across others. Um, and so the final thing in in post discharge care that I, I would want, want to talk about is improved accessibility to cognitive rehab and improve social support for stroke survivors. Um, this was a somewhat jarring quote from Nick Ward, who is another stroke neurologist. He works at UCL London um, and he said it and I thought, damn, that's harsh. And then I thought about it and I, I thought, well, actually it's accurate. It's not, it's not entirely too harsh because um, most stroke survivors do not get uh, easy access to cognitive rehabilitation. Um, on, on the outpatient end, uh, to, to be very clear. And so um, one of the things that we've been working on here is, again, trying to make the protocol financially sustainable. So there are billing codes that are available for remote cognitive assessment and for clinical interpretation of that remote con uh, um, cognitive assessment. And they actually pay pretty well for, for what you're doing. Um, and, um, and they allow us to start the conversation about cognition, because I think some of the biggest issues that we have with providing cognitive rehabilitation resources to stroke patients is that in all of the, the sort of fuss to get them functionally independent, Often cognition is just sort of put to the side as, look, we'll, we'll get to that later. You know, either, either you have so many complex and challenging perceptual issues and cognitive issues that you're going to need a full-time carer anyway, or sure, you're not, you're not cognitively and perceptually the same, but you're getting by. So we're going to focus on the limb or we're going to focus on, you know, getting you walking or, or doing ADLs. And so I think that what we've discovered is when we apply these billing codes and when we use technologies to do the cognitive assessment, that allows the physiatrist who's managing care to say, hey, well, yeah, you know, like these domains, you know, executive function domain is, is well below average. Let's, th this allows us to enroll them into a cognitive rehabilitation program. And then our brain injury research center can take it from there. Um, so, uh, you know, just as a quick aside, the technology that we use is called brain check. Um, it's very, very simple to use. Um, and, uh, and that's why we use it. it. To be honest, it's much of a muchness. There are so many different cognitive assessment tools out there, and this is not doing anything particularly special. It is using, um, existing, uh, cognitive assessment paradigms like the Stroop test and the Flanker test and the digit symbol substitution test. And it's just computerizing them in a way that allows easy administration. Um, but uh, we've we've worked with them; they're, they're uh, inf information security approved, and 
um, and they do what they say they do. So, you know, they're, they're very easy to work with and, and the billing codes work when we drop them. Um, on the social support side, uh, there's, you know, paper after paper after paper telling us that not only does social connection improve, um, uh, improve outcomes in people with chronic illnesses, um, but it also, it, it also helps to fight loneliness, which is a health uh, threat right on its own. So, you know, the, as I'm sure many of you know, the latest data shows that the um, health damage associated with loneliness is, is, has been equalized to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So if you are not addressing your patient's social isolation and their loneliness, you're not looking after their health. I think at this point, the data is strong enough to support that this is the case. We're in the process of building out a collaboration with the same U Foundation, which is a UK based uh, charity that is focused on helping people recover from acquired brain injury through a lot of social support and, and social coaching from the community. And what we're trying to, um, what we're trying to launch here is basically, you know, um, a button in, in any of our digital health experiences for stroke survivors, where they can immediately be connected with thousands of stroke survivors anywhere in the world who have been through what they've been through and can coach them through the process. And SAMU has this amazing community of over 100,000 stroke survivors who are sharing their stories, offering up their expertise and their experiences to uh, help people through. So this is something, this is a collaboration that we're incredibly excited to get off the ground um, and we should be getting it off the ground in the fall. But um, I, I think it's going to really close the loop on some very important um, social support and services for stroke survivors. So now, uh, you know, a couple of mugs that you guys might find familiar. Um, the, the question is, can we be influencing other elements on the, on the, the recovery continuum? Um, and so uh, Chris Kellner and, and Neha um, and I have been really sort of working this problem and thinking about what else could we be doing um, that, that really starts to close a lot of loops, improve continuity of care, improve, uh, reduce the fragmenting of care that occurs with a lot of stroke patients as they get bounced around um, to different, you know, inter-facility transfers and, um, and, and uh, you know, taken around in ambulances around the, the whole city. So um, now, rather than thinking about what happens after discharge, let's think about what happens pre-admission. Um, so one of the things that we're working on together, and, and Neha has really been sort of leading the charge on this, but um, it's a very exciting opportunity, is we want to see if we can build a, a smart ambulance that allows for physiologic monitoring and um, and just general uh, transparent communication between the EMT and a clinician at the emergency department that the stroke patient is heading to. We think that over time, if we can if we can sync this up and make it seamless, <clears throat> we think that um, maybe many interfacility transfers won't be required because the EMT will already get information from the ED that they're going to, that they need to go to a different facility based on the metrics that are being seen and a clinician on the other end of things looking at the patient um, through a video link and, um, and evaluating the patient. Um, we think that also there could just be generally better care coordination in terms of um, the EMT being able to ping the staff that's waiting in the emergency department what the status of the patient is, how far out they are, so on and so forth. So just creating a little bit more interaction between those two teams um, seems like it could improve things. We, we don't know yet, we're still building it and we're still looking at it from all angles. But really the point here is we're trying to go step-by-step step in all of these pathways and see where we can be optimizing. Um, and so we, we've... Uh, <clears throat> partnered with a group called Visionable, which is a UK-based um, telehealth company. And we're, again, in the processes of looking at what building 
an app like this might look like, how do we integrate it into our systems, or all, all of those fun information security questions and uh, IT security questions. But, um, you know, it, it's been an absolute joy uh, working with Neha and Chris on this, and it's been great to see progress happening, however incrementally, because everyone understands that this seems to be a good idea. And it, it's it's about fixing an easy problem. Communication between an e, between EMTs and the hospital theoretically should be, you know, and this is famous last words, of course, but theoretically should be an easy easy problem to solve. And if we can solve it, we, we think that long-term outcomes of the patient could improve. Um, the other project that I'm really excited about to be working on with uh, Neha is enhancing neurosurgical ICU rooms. So many of you might be aware that we partnered in the pandemic with a group called Studio Elsewhere to build these recharge rooms <clears throat> um, and just reimagine space for both uh, clinicians who are experiencing stress and for patients as well. So, you know, um, I, uh, I, I also, in addition to running it, uh, adult centers, I, I run a pediatric center called the Charles Lazarus Children's Ability Center. And, and when our, our donors um, generously gave us a gift to start the center, um, yeah, Union Square generously gave us space <laughs> to build the center out. And uh, the before and after photos are quite striking, I think you'll agree. Um, and, you know, what has, <clears throat> has been truly incredible to see is how the kids respond to our uh, treated rooms versus the standard hospital rooms and how they go from having a very negative experience in the hospital setting to have, you know, running around and wanting to play and having the hospital be an enjoyable and fun place. Um, and so we've seen the effects of these rooms on healthy physiology. Um, this is, this is data from well over a thousand users of the recharge rooms across um, two states and 20 different recharge rooms. And what we can see is if pa patients spend a minimum of 15 minutes in these rooms, we get a 35% increase in self-reported alertness and we get an 87.5% reduction in self-reported stress. So these are big numbers for um, uh, you know, for, for a seemingly superficial change to a room. Um, and so the next steps that we're working on on this project, I'm um, super excited to, to delve into. And we've recently secured um, uh, funding to, to move forward is to work with Neha and Mirel, who is the founder of Studio Elsewhere, to build out a space that could reimagine what, what care is like for patients in the neurosurgical ICU. Um, you know, and what we're the the sort of concepts that we're throwing around are how can we dampen alarms so that both patients and clinicians aren't constantly being assaulted by different different alarm tones? How do we change lighting so that um, we can encourage natural circadian rhythms even in a minimally conscious patient so that they don't just always have these harsh lights on them or complete darkness? They have lights that go from the ground to the ceiling, back to the ground, that are, are synced up with um, with Eastern Standard Time, so that patients can still, even while they're you know in this minimally conscious state, have the surroundings that um, that don't let them lose their circadian rhythm. So these are all you know wild ideas, but fun and creative ideas as well. And these are some of the things that that we're working on. So. Uh, I just, I, I want to finish there. Um, I hope that has been helpful um, and and has uh, has really uh, identified how we do what we do in terms of building out new programs and, uh, and, and getting things off the ground um, in a rapid way and a pragmatic way. Um, I can't stress enough um, how grateful I am to the Department of Neurosurgery. The, you know, this can only happen when you have departments who are constantly interacting and collaborating. And, you know, I think we all know how rare it is to have departments truly collaborate with the common goal being improving patient welfare and improving patient outcomes, as opposed to who gets the NIH grant. So 
you know, I, I, I just want to stress that, you know, none of this is possible without great interdisciplinary collaboration. I hope we can pull <laughs> more departments in to be collaborative as well, uh, is, is my only wish uh, as we start to build this out. And um, I'm really excited to see where this goes. Um, I also want to acknowledge everyone uh, on, you know, the amazing teams that I get to work in. And uh, because I just get to talk about this stuff, it's, it's a whole lot of other people who are actually doing the work. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we can stop there for questions. That's terrific. Maybe we can ask Chris for a couple of comments since he's a partner in crime with you. You know, I, I do spend quite a lot of time with David Petrino and I, I really enjoy every minute of it. Um, I was surprised at how much new stuff there was in this that I didn't even know uh, David was engaged in. And it's, you know, you see that every time you talk to him, he's really doing so much. I especially appreciate David that you focus on uh, removing the barriers to implementing a technology, which is, as we know, um, working on new technologies all the time, that that's a major factor in whether or not you can bring a technology to a patient. Um, is there a ceiling to neurorehabilitation? You know, is, is there too much neurorehab? You're talking about the homeopathic dosing of outpatient rehab. You know, if we if we had full control of the patient's time, is there a maximum? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> you've probably heard me say this before, um, but I work with a lot of uh, high performance athletes, and for me, the the biggest disconnect is <clears throat> when I'm working with, um, you know, a Team USA fencer or an NBA basketballer, and we're trying to get them to acquire a new skill or extinguish a bad habit or, you know, do whatever they need to do. Um, we, we place such an emphasis on many, many hours of work, of course, cross training. So <laughs> lots of different skill acquisitions in different situations and, um, and, and just enjoyment and fun. You know, we, it, it's not just, Hey, you're bad at sinking a three pointer. So just, stand there and do it over and over again. That's never how we do things. Um, and so ostensibly we're trying to do the same thing here. We're trying to create motor learning in an adult brain, um, but the approaches are so disparate. But the other thing to, to focus on with, with athletes is you can overtrain athletes very, very easily. And I think that this is a consideration. It's not just smash a stroke patient with as much rehab as you possibly can. No, we, we also, we, we do need to approach it from a coaching standpoint where we're seeing how much fatigue we're creating in their nervous system, how much tone we're increasing, um, how much central fatigue we're triggering because many stroke patients have post-exertional symptom exacerbation. So it's always um, a moving target with each patient. But what you do want to be able to do is keep them on task for as long as, as humanly possible while they're still enjoying it, while they're still feeling that they're having a novel experience and, um, and while they're still happy to do it. Awesome. David, when we spoke about this earlier, uh, we were concerned about how to get it paid for. And you mentioned that as a big hurdle. Um, at one point, I understand you were looking to uh, amplify the physician input by having nurses and other mid-level advanced level practitioners do the um, the monitoring or at least respond to alerts is that still a mechanism that is working for you yes absolutely um so for the uh, uh for the remote physiologic monitoring we, we have advanced practice providers um you know they can be nurses, nurse practitioners, OTs, PTs, even uh, PTAs and OTAs are eligible for, for performing these tasks. And we've had good success with that. Um, on the remote therapeutic monitoring uh, billing codes, um, which are, are now active, um, our plan is to only have PTAs uh, dropping those codes because um, the PTAs typically are very well versed in what is going on in, in 
that particular patient. And so they can certainly view the data and make the necessary tweaks um, with, you know, with the PT looking over their shoulder um, approach, you know, uh, supervising. So I think that these models, because the billing codes don't pay a lot. So I think you need to be really strategic about who does the monitoring. Um, and that's where building the infrastructure to do the monitoring comes in, of course, because we we are all at capacity, including right. our advanced practice providers, but um, it has been working out so far. What, what parallels do you see in post-operative care to stroke care? You know, a few of us on the call uh, take care of stroke patients, but you know, but many of the people on this call take care of spine patients, for example. All four of the Art Jenkins in the attendee list there uh, take mm -hmm. care of spine patients. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I think there are many parallels. I, I think, I think the biggest challenge with um, uh, the biggest challenge we've faced so far with post-operative care is finding um, on the remote physiologic monitoring side is finding a good faith physiologic metric to track uh, post-surgery because, unfortunately, snapping photos of the wound. Initially, CMS said they were going to fund that. They're not funding that as a physiologic biomarker. They said they were going to fund subjective reporting of pain. They're not funding that. Um, and and it's sometimes iffy to uh, and you know I'll, I'll leave it to the servants, uh, surgeons to tell me if I'm correct or not. But it's sometimes iffy to encourage a daily blood pressure metric in in most interventional spine patients. It's just you know do you really need to be doing that? So the, on the physiologic side, it's been challenging. On the remote therapeutic monitoring side, I think that there is a lot that could potentially be done. Um, I think that a lot of the emerging apps like Kaya, Hinge Health, groups like that, um, that can do, that can provide you with some indication of range of motion, or uh, we're collaborating with a group right now on total hip and total knee, Surgery is called One Step that does um, uh, gate lab uh, like metrics from the smartphone, um, and and then they use you know that they use those metrics to guide the therapist and say maybe you should up these exercises or you know reduce these exercises. I think that remote therapeutic monitoring is the way to go with with a lot of post surgical care because um, uh, it, it's much easier to justify the need for that when you want to be watching someone really closely. I mean, I haven't done interventional spine rehab for 15 years, but I remember the nervousness of sending a patient home with a home exercise program and hoping that they don't go beyond a certain range of motion or they you know, don't push something too hard. And um, I would imagine that that hasn't changed all that much. I would imagine that that's still a concern when, when rehabbing an interventional spine patient that they don't perform a movement that's that's out of range for them um and so that's that's where i see a real benefit occurring see neha's got her hand up there hey neha hey thank you so much david for an excellent excellent talk and I do want to share that a couple of things, and particularly for the residents on the call that we learn from these kinds of collaborations, is that research doesn't have to be linear when we're trying to solve really complex problems. When you look at stroke systems of care from primary prevention to treatment to rehab to recovery, there's so much, and it can be very overwhelming. But it's possible, what, what David's work shows us, that it's really possible to parallel process across the continuum of stroke recovery if you have the right team. David, advice on how people who are um, interested in collaborating with industry and innovating, because you showed us that value of uh, uh, innovation and how long it takes to translate innovations to clinical practice, all those, those 17 years. So how does one balance industry collaborations versus this need to try to try to get some NIH funding? How do you, how do, you do all of that? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think that... <clears throat> The, the point, so I, I think that moving moving into working with industry, uh, the, the thing that needs to be stressed is it's rarely a stable funding model. You know, the reason, well, the reason institutions love NIH funding is because 
it enhances our, our rating as a, as a university, which is important. You know, we want to be at a top rated university and that is in many ways, um, you know, tempered by how much NIH funding we bring in. And the reason that investigators like NIH funding is because it's often, you know, it's five years of not having to worry about how you're going to fund your lab and not having to worry about what you're doing. Industry funding is less attractive because it's usually, hey, we're going to do a 12 month pilot and see how it goes. And so you've constantly, first of all, I, I think um, you need to make sure that you can handle that risk. Um, I was very fortunate in that um, I was hired at Mount Sinai to do this. So, you know, I was able to focus and target on this. But um, for those who want to partner with industry, I think the first thing is, is A, making sure that it's risk that you can tolerate, you know, um, and and you understand that like, if something goes wrong with an industry collaboration, you may have to let some of your staff go or, you know, um, or, or quickly pivot because that that's the nature of the industry collaboration. Um, the second thing that I would give advice to is there's a lot of people who see the industry money, get dollar signs in their eyes and chase industry collaborations that don't make sense. Um, we turn down far more industry collaborations than we take on because we only want to interact with industry collaborations that fit into our whole narrative. Um, and so unless we, you know, unless I can find myself or a team member who's, you know, at the faculty level in, in my lab, who wants to lead a project, who is, who is enthusiastic, who really says, you know, this is going to change the way that if, if the clinical trial works out, this will change the way that I practice. If I if if we find that level of interest and excitement in a project, that's when we take it on. And I think that that should that's the best advice I can give. Like, don't just take the industry money because it's industry money and they're handing it out. If you you know because your time and you should respect your time and effort and only do things that you know fit the narrative of this is a problem that I'm passionate about solving or this is a product that I can see myself immediately integra integrating into clinical practice if the clinical trial data looks good. And that's kind of what we've done because I think that, you know, that valley of death that we always talk about, it's a valley of apathy. Like it's people sort of fall into the valley of death because, because academic medical centers just they're not so, you know, like they can't find that one person that's really enthusiastic about their product. And that could be because the product is bad <laughs> or it could be because they're knocking on the wrong doors. Um, and so that would be my, my general advice uh, for people who are looking to take on industry collaborations. Thank you so much, excellent advice and so grateful to learn from you and collaborate with you. Oh, always Neha, you too. All right, well, thank you so much, David. I think, unless there are any other questions, I think we'll end here. Terrific, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Talk soon.